Hello and welcome to episode 14 of the Scottish Liberty Podcast. With me, Tom Laird. And me, Anthony Samaroff. Today, I'm delighted to introduce a very special guest, Swedish and Kurdish author and economist, Dr. Nima Sanandaji, who is the author of the recent book, Debunking Utopia, which I read with much interest last week, and he's been kind enough to join us on the show. Hello, Nima. Thank you for joining us. Hello. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. So I was actually thrilled with the book that you released, and this is a follow-up to last year's book, Scandinavian on Exceptionalism. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. So last year I released the book Scandinavian on Exceptionalism, which basically explained that um, Nordic countries, yes, they're very successful, but the success of Nordic countries that does not prove that socialism works. Because Nordic countries are successful because free markets, because of um, their unique culture of hard work. And that book gained a lot of international attention. It's been translated to many different languages. I think currently it's even being translated to Japanese. Wow. Okay. So then we did this new book, which is a more popular, longer version. And um, Debunking Utopia, Exposing the Myth of Nordic Socialism, was released like a month ago. And it's been number one, number two best-selling book in its category on Amazon. Fantastic. And I, we've got, like, you know, Financial Times, um, Bloomberg, Foreign Affairs, and in total, around 100 uh, international press sightings. So there's a lot of interest for the issue. Okay, and what's the reaction to the book in the Nordic countries, and especially Sweden itself, Nima? Yeah, you know, so maybe your listeners are saying, who cares about Nordic countries? <laughs> well, that's not the case. I mean, definitely in Scotland, there's a lot of very left-leaning people who are extraordinarily politically active and have been citing the Nordic countries as the model that Scotland should be following, particularly Denmark and to some extent Sweden as well. I mean, those two countries are held up as the model for for Scotland, so I think that uh, people do care, but nonetheless, maybe you you can tell us a little bit about why you think this is important to us internationally. You know what? I like what you say because the reason people care so much about my writings and these issues is that the Nordic countries are currently being used as a number one argument for why socialism works. Yeah, right. And what I do in Debunking Utopia, Exposing the Myth of Nordic Socialism, is I systematically go through and destroy all these arguments. There is mm-hmm. no basis, basic foundation for them once you look more in depth. And actually, I show that the Nordic countries are perhaps the best proofs that free markets work, that societies can thrive if they have economic freedom coupled with strong culture, which kind of promotes individual responsibility. And I also show that the welfare state in Nordic countries has actually slowly been right. creating social problems in these countries instead of solving them. Right, and I'd love to get into the details of that shortly. But before we do that, the commonly held view is that basically the Nordic countries are high-tax, high-regulation states with lots of public ownership of public services and a large welfare state and that they have better standards of living than us here and therefore we should be striving to copy that model. I think that's a summation of the commonly held view. What I'd love to know is the basic case for why that logic is flawed. You know, isn't that true? Don't they have higher standards of living? Aren't they happier? Aren't they richer? And why, if that is true, is that not proof that a large welfare state and high taxes doesn't promote well-being across a nation? Yeah, Yeah. so let me systematically go through this. Firstly, yes, Nordic countries are um, prosperous. But no, they are not prosperous because of socialism. So let me take Sweden as a very good example. Sweden had a free market period from like the late 19th century until around 1970. Sweden had a period of very much economic freedom because you should remember that the Nordic countries during the first 
half of the 20th century were uniquely pro-market, uniquely small government, uniquely pro-capitalism. In many ways, they were even more pro-capitalism than the United States. They had minimal government involvement in their economies. Even during the Great Depression, their governments had losses fair policies. And uh, they were very, very successful during this free market era. Sweden, for example, during the free market era, before the first social democrat government came, had the highest growth rate in all of Europe. Okay. Then the country had a period where the social democrats came to power, but they were kind of very careful not to kill the golden goose of capitalism. Right. So, yeah, so they were slowly introducing welfare programs. And when Sweden, did this happen around? In the, in the 1930s until 1970, and then Sweden had mediocre economic development. Right. Then Sweden, around 1970, as the only Nordic country, actually attempted socialism. 1970 until 1991. And this was an utter failure for the country. It had the lowest growth rate in the uh, Western Europe. It was a complete disaster. Even the socialists uh, today don't think it was a good idea. And this was followed up by massive market reforms, tax cuts, welfare cuts from 1991 and forward. And again, Sweden had skyrocketed in growth. Uh, had the second highest growth rate after the UK during this period. Wow. So what I show in my book is systematically, it's obvious that a Nordic country's prosperity has been growing in periods of economic freedom and is because of economic freedom and is hurt by high taxes. So take Denmark as an example. People say, yeah, Denmark has high taxes. They do. They have very high taxes. But Denmark has the same economic freedom score as the United States has. Why? Because in every other field, they are very, very much pro-market, pro-business. They're consistently ranked as one of the best countries in the world to do business in because they have a very strong protection of private property. Right. They have very much market liberalizations in nearly every area. So Nordic countries' success, the economic success, is actually a very strong case for free markets. Okay. My understanding of it is that although uh, Sweden particularly, you know, has a reputation for being a socialist country, the reality even now is that in many ways Sweden is far more liberal uh, economically and far more free market than, for example, even the United Kingdom. Would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... They have more free market regulations on businesses. Yeah. We have a partial privatization of the pension system. We have a voucher system. Private companies carry out much of the welfare in school, in healthcare, elderly care. Yeah. So yes, Nordic countries to a large degree have more market reforms than not only the UK, but also the US. Really? Right. That's well, extraordinary. Some free marketeers or, you know, libertarians like ourselves have actually heard that Nordic countries in some ways are more free market than the UK or the US, but it was really good to get some specifics on that. So what is it the countries like the UK, France or the USA could learn about freedom from Scandinavia? What policies could we adopt if we want to succeed in the ways that they have? You know what? Nordic countries have been compensating for their high taxes by introducing market liberalizations in every area. And what you can learn is basically to have a very smooth public government regulation and don't have government involvement in the private sector. Now, the point of Nordic countries prospering because of capitalism is not the main point of my book, Debunking Utopia, Exposing the Myth of Nordic Socialism. Mm. I think the okay. main point I do make, and which is a very or original point, which is quoted by very much internationally, is this. Yes, Nordic countries are socially successful, mm -hmm. right? They have low poverty rates. Uh, they have a uh, high uh, life expectancy. They have low child mortality. Mm -hmm. And they have big welfare states. Yeah. But right. you know what? There is the link people see doesn't exist because Nordic countries were socially successful before the big welfare states. Because of their cultures, they became socially successful. Okay. During the free market small government era, I show in my book, Debunking Utopia, arguably Nordic countries were even more socially successful before the big welfare states. 
So in what ways does Scandinavian cultures differ from the rest of Europe, and what role has that had to play in Scandinavia's success? So uh, I'm a Kurdish Iranian immigrant. As an outsider, you see that these people have a very unique culture. They have very much strong working ethics, responsibility ethics. Yeah. And from a historical perspective, these Protestant Northern European countries had very harsh climates. Yeah. And they were inhabited by independent uh, farmers with private property. Right. Mm. So they kind of developed a culture where people had to work hard if they didn't want to starve, but they also had a system already in the Middle Ages that very strongly rewarded individual responsibility. Right. Because they had pri private property uh, long before the rest of Europe had it for... Okay, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. They, they didn't adopt so much of a feudal system as in the rest of... No, no. You're Absolutely right. not. And these very strong n norms of uh, responsibility ethics, working ethics, they actually explain the Nordic social success. So one thing I did, uh, I've been doing a book tour in the U.S. And one of the things like Bernie Sanders, the American mm -hmm. socialist, mm -hmm. like to say is, you know, look at Denmark. They're so successful. They have a high tax and big welfare state. Yeah. And many, 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 many people say this. That's right. And I say, okay, yeah. So Danish people live one and a half years longer than Americans. And right. Americans are like, you know, we should have socialized medicine, then we'd, we'd live one and a half years longer. Okay. My response is, okay, but in 1960, did you know that Denmark had lower taxes than U.S. at the time? <laughs> well, I didn't know that, no. Very small uh, public sector, very low taxes. Now, here's the thing. In 1960, the lifespan difference between Denmark and the U.S. was 2.4 years. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. And, it's not only Denmark. All of the Nordic countries had a bigger lifespan difference before they moved to a big welfare state. Wow, that's really remarkable. And something that you followed up on in the book in terms of trying to demonstrate how much culture matters is you noted that people of Nordic descent in America were outperforming people in Nordic countries and you said there was a case to be made there that that's because the American system is actually more prone to success when you have that cultural background. Have I, have I got that right? And is there anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, you know what? I calculated if the Nordic Americans had their own countries, what would their GDP per capita be? <laughs> and, okay. um, so I did that for, you know, Danish Americans, Finnish Americans, and so on. And I showed that if you compare like Swedish Americans with Swedes and so on, the Nordic Americans, now you have to realize the Nordic Americans are the descendants of a lot of Nordic people who left for America. And the people who left were the impoverished people, right? right. Okay. They were those who didn't have land. And Nordic Americans are like 12 million people, which is higher than the population of any individual Nordic country. So you would expect these people to have, be less affluent because their forefathers were the Poor guys. Yeah. Well, yeah. they have 50% higher living standard than their cousins in the Nordics. Wow, that's really remarkable. But the really remarkable thing is they are more socially successful. Okay. They have almost half the unemployment rate. Okay. They have much, 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 much lower high school dropout rate. So in Denmark, the high school dropout rate is 25%. Wow, that's really high. Yeah, and it's, uh, you know, I think many immigrants are dropping out. Mm. Among Danish Americans, it's three and a half percent. Right. Okay. And uh, the really astonishing thing is I show that if you use the same poverty measure, Nordic Americans have nearly half the poverty rate of the Nordics. Okay. And could you be able to put that discrepancy down to any one single fact? I mean, why are ethnic... Scandinavians in the U.S. outperforming their, the people in their homeland? What is it? Is there one single factor or is it a multitude of different things? I think it's two factors. One of them is that U.S. actually has better policies. They have more, you know, lower taxes, smaller government. Okay. And also, I mean, the most important is obviously you see, wow, it is culture. It's not a welfare state, mm. right? Yeah. That's the most important thing. It is not a welfare state. It's like, let us adopt the Nordic style welfare state. 
It is Nordic deep social institutions like culture. And that is why the left are using the Nordics as a number one argument. Yeah. Because of course they're pointing to the benefits of Nordic culture and they say right. this is socialism. Okay. Has this ever worked in any other welfare state which is not Nordic? Right. No, it hasn't. Yeah. That's the main thing, right? But, but, but also that American system seems to be actually better. And also, I should add, Nordic countries, uh, when you look at them, you're including people like me, immigrants, mm-hmm. and immigrants have less good social outcomes. So that, that might be the explanation why Nordic countries have much higher poverty rates mm. than their cousins in the Nordics. Yeah. But my point is that, okay, maybe that explains to some part why Nordic people are doing so much worse than Nordic Americans. But at least, at the very least, we see that it is Nordic culture, not the big welfare state, that is the root of this social success. And, you know, that is a very important argument. Yeah. Because that shatters much of the intellectual support the left currently has globally for implementing big welfare state. You take away the Nordic argument from the left. What are they pointing to? Are they saying that California has good social outcomes because they have a big welfare state? Mm. Italy, Spain, Greece? No. Yeah. Right. I think we're getting to something really important here and also to some people quite controversial because I think we would like to think if you give people the same opportunities, they're going to have the same outcomes. If that isn't the case, it's really important we talk about it because we are living at the state of technology where we can essentially look at what's good in different cultures and, you know, assimilate it, export it. You know, we benefit from having access to philosophy from all the different countries in the world and, and trying to get the best things out of all of them. But it seems like cultural norms that might have taken hundreds of years, maybe a couple of thousands of years to develop in a short period of a couple of generations can be lost if the wrong policies are adopted. Because once people lose the skills, say, of of a good work ethic, of being able to speak to customers, to suppliers, to negotiate, to advocate for themselves, and to go out and get whatever they want from their lives, whatever they want from their lives, they can't pass on those skills to their kids. So I want to ask you a really critical question. We've heard that a generous welfare state can disincentivize productive work, erode people's work ethic, and even create a underclass of dependency that becomes really hard for people or their children to actually dig themselves back out of. And, you know, this isn't a go at the poor or people are wealthy or anything like that, but we have heard that claim. And is there any evidence for that claim, or is it just right-wing propaganda? And is there any evidence of that claim from Scandinavia and then other places that you've heard of evidence that supports that claim. Yeah. So, you know, I think, why, why is it that debunking utopia exposing the myth of Nordic socialism is quoted so widely and is selling so good? I think that this is exactly because I, I kind of show with a lot of data and research. Yeah. Yeah. What you just said. And, you know, let me just make clear. I am not an ideological libertarian. Okay. I am not a right winger. I am not, um, you know, political, you know, very strongly leaning to, uh, one way. And I myself grew up in wealth, uh, by welfare support in Sweden, okay. like many other immigrants. So I think, okay, good, you know, have a small welfare state. That's good. Help, help the poor. But what I show in debunking utopia is that the very strong Nordic norms about responsibility, about hard work, that is what made a big welfare state possible, right? Because right. if you have those norms, you can have a big welfare state. But over the generations, the welfare state has been crumbling the norms of work and in individual responsibility. Right. And in the process, creating a class of socially poor, welfare dependent people. Okay. And this social poverty is very deep mm. and is actually caused to some degree by overly generous welfare policies. And all Nordic countries have during the past two, three decades been moving towards market reforms lower taxes, lower generosity in the welfare states, and welfare reforms. 
And the only thing I kind of regret about the book is, uh, you know, when you write a book, you send it to your publisher and they print it. You can't change it. Mm. Just before it came out and just after it came out, Denmark has been doing massive welfare reforms. One of the biggest welfare reforms in Western countries currently is going on in Denmark. And the Swedish centre-right opposition, which is likely to form government next election, has also suggested massive welfare reform. So how does the form of the welfare state kind of work in that cultural element, that hard work ethic take place? How can we see the evidence of that? What What is the evidence of that? And is there anything that can be done, apart from just cutting the welfare state, back, lowering the generosity of the welfare state to help those people get themselves out of poverty, either by government policy or by, you know, social movements. Yeah, you know what, I have one of the chapters in Debunking Utopia is exactly about this, and I cite a lot of very detailed research, which which not only shows research that kind of separates cause and causality. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it shows that too much welfare is destroying Nordic working ethics. Mm. Now, one, one thing is that there's a world value survey which asks uh, people in like Nordic countries in their 80s, is it ever right to overuse government uh, programs you're not entitled to? Mm. And at the time, Nordic people had, had a generous welfare, but they hadn't quite adapted their norms to it. So almost everybody said, no, it's never right to overuse government benefits. Right. But today, when you ask the same question, half of the Nordic people say, yes, it is okay to, t- you know, get government benefits you are not entitled to. Okay. Okay. So that's one measure. But let me, for example, say, I think the best study I quote is in Norway, which has the most generous welfare state, because they have so much oil money that they have generous welfare paid by oil. Okay. In Norway... If you're not entitled to government benefits, you can go to court and say, I want to have government benefits anyway. Mm -hmm. And there are researchers who said, you know what, some judges are conservative. So they'll say, no, you're not entitled to benefits, you don't get them. And some are progressive, so they'll just give benefits to everybody. And from the perspective of the individual, it's a random process what judge you get. Right. So it's kind of like an experiment. And therefore, you can actually separate cause. Is is there a link or is it causality? And what the researchers find by using this natural experiment is that, yes, the decision to give welfare leads to much higher risk of being dependent on welfare in the future. Okay. And the children, the next generation, even greater effect. Oh, man. So yeah, yeah, absolutely too generous welfare is actually harming the poor in Nordic countries and trapping them and their children in social poverty. What I'd like to ask, I mean, that's the welfare to the poor. How is Scandinavia generally on corporate welfare? Do they give generous handouts of public money to big corporations? For example, how did it go with the banking crisis? Did they bail out bankers to the same extent as we did here in the UK and other countries? Or... Is it the same? Are they cutting back on corporate welfare, which is a big spend as well in these countries? Nordic countries are not as bad in uh, in corporate welfare as the UK. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because as as I say, besides having high taxes and generous welfare policies, in most other areas, they are more free market than the UK, the US, and the rest of the world. Yeah. They're very pragmatic, and they, they, they do inherently understand the power of free markets. So, you know, you could learn from them in that regard. So, one thing I was going to ask, when you said that you're actually for a welfare state, just the more minimal or discerning ones, have you seen any policies that could make the welfare state more smart, supposing in our nation or in any other country in the world, that could maybe be more effective at helping the poor without creating the same levels of dependency, you know, what do those models look like? What would be your policy recommendations if someone came to you and said, you know, Dr. Sanandaji, we've read your book and we, we want to take this problem seriously? Yeah, so, you know, I've written more than 100 policy reforms and 20 books about development in Nordic countries and on many different subjects. 
And so one example I would say is that if you look at children, even small children, you see huge difference in knowledge between the children of an academic family and the children of a working class family and the children of a welfare class family. Right. So if you have children who are like four years old, they don't speak the same language because mm. the guys from the academic family have so much better vocabulary. So basically what you can do is you can target education programs at like uh, preschoolers and, you know, just raise the knowledge level of children from disadvantaged families, immigrant families, because that helps. Right. And it doesn't cost that much money. So you basically give knowledge to children from disadvantaged right. families. And that works because that doesn't trap in poverty. It lifts up from poverty. Fantastic. I love what you're saying. So it's more of a teacher man to fish rather than throw them a fish way of looking at it. And on the subject of education, we've heard that, you know, Finland had, a, I believe, a terribly failing education system. So what they decided to do was, like, start at the beginning, rip it up and start again. And we've heard they built the best education system in the world that outperforms everyone else. Is that the case? What do you think of Finland's education system? Should we be adopting it abroad? And are there any shortcomings or drawbacks? Those are four questions. So if you need a recap, just yeah. let me know. Well, you know, let me uh, begin. You have to see Finland and Sweden at the same time. Because, let me explain. So let's begin with Sweden, actually. Sweden had a very good education system. So, for example, when they measured adults' skills in, like, the mid-1990s, they saw that Sweden had the best adult skills on the planet. Okay. Right. Education system, right? Right. And so they, they had a very good education system in like the 1960s, 70s. It was a very conservative school system. You know, it was very disciplined. And, you know, they were good at it. And they had good kindergartens. Now, Finland did the same. They had a very conservative school system. They built it up. And in Finland, the thing was, you know, Finland for so long had been dominated by Sweden, by Russia. Yeah. When at the World War, when they were free, they kind of said, we have, it's a national project to build up a very good school system. They were very strict and, you know, students were disciplined and they would study a lot. And they had very good results. Now, what happens in Sweden is progressive ideas come in. And they say, no, the teachers should not have the power in school. The students should have the power in school. Oh. Teachers can't say to students, don't chew, uh, chew a gum or have a hat or play with your cell phone. <laughs> students <laughs> are entrepreneurs. They're, they're learning as entrepreneurs, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. <laughs> and Sweden has had the greatest fall, you know, in PISA, when they compare education results. Okay. Right. No country has had as rapidly diminishing school results as Sweden partially because of immigration, obviously, but partially, maybe even more, because of these progressive ideas destroying the school system. Right. Okay. Now, right. Finland has a good school system, but they have started to introduce the same bad ideas as Sweden has. Right. So, you know, we haven't seen Finland fall in Pisa quite yet, but basically, they've been moving towards a good education system towards a bad one. Okay. So admire the old education system in Sweden and Finland. Admire that one. Don't admire the new one. Okay. And, and in your view, is it more important to invest, if indeed we're going to have government investment in education, is it more important to invest at primary level than at higher education level? Well, I mean, if, if you want to kind of help the poor and if you want to make a very smart social investment, yes. Yeah, invest right. more in early childhood development and, you know, find the disadvantaged children, find those who have problems learning, find those who are already violent when they are four years old, because many of the, those who become criminals are actually having problems as four-year-olds. Wow. And, you know, so, yes, absolutely. Yeah. And I would also say that the thing about countries like Sweden and Finland, the big problem they get when they move from this traditional school model to this super leftist progressive thing is that they're hurting the students who come from disadvantaged mm -hmm. families because yeah. instead of learning, they get into crime and gangs. Mm -hmm. My own best friend in junior high school became a gang leader and selling drugs and shooting people, so you know. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's well, he's obviously a handy man to know if you get in trouble, I suppose. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah. 
So I want to change tack a bit because, you know, for free marketeers like us, well, I can't speak for everyone, but I've often heard it said that, you know, for us, inequality is actually less important to us than social mobility is. So in other words, it's not so much a problem for us if, you know, some people are rich, so long as it's not like this exclusive club that other people don't have a cho choice or a chance of breaking into, no matter how hard they work or what they're willing to contribute to achieve a better standard of living. So we want to see that there's enough freedom for people who are born into the lower rungs of the, the ladder to pursue opportunities and get to the top and you know, better themselves in, in the process. I don't, I don't mean better themselves on the soul level. I just mean, you know, learn more skills, become more competent, feel like they're in charge of their own destiny so that they can get as far as they're willing to push themselves. But if it's true that in Nordic countries there's more social mobility, then maybe we lose our ground on the debate that we say, look, you should liberalise and have free markets and and that's the way to give the poor a chance. And it's much better than the, the government stepping in because that's just going to create dependency. So we've heard that social mobility is greater in Scandinavian countries. And is that true? So that's one of the chapters in my book. The thing is, when they measure social mobility, what happens is if you have a country like Nordic countries, they have like one big group, like Icelandic people in Iceland. Right. They're yeah. homogeneous. And of course, within that group, you'll have a lot of mobility. Then you look at a country like the UK or the US even, they have a lot of different groups. And then you say, ah, oh, it's less mobility. Of course, it's less mobility because you're comparing apples with oranges. Yeah. You, and you can't do that. I mean, the same would be if you divide up the UK, like the Scotland was its own country, you would automatically have more social mobility. Mm. And if you would divide Scotland in like four different countries, Again, you would have more social mobility. So right. the more homogeneous mm. the population, it seems it's more mobile. It's just, you know, a bad comparison. So what yeah. I do is I, I look at immigrants, right? right? Because they're outsiders. And what I do is I show that what is the social mobility of immigrants? It is horrible in Nordic countries. They get trapped in welfare dependency, uh, high in unemployment. And even the report, self-reported health of immigrants and the school result of immigrants is very bad in Nordic countries and is actually much better in the U.S. Mm, right. So, mm. so, and, you know, free market Anglo-Saxon countries have better social mobility for immigrants than Nordic countries do. And the U.K. is somewhere in between. You're worse than the other Anglo-Saxon countries, which have more freedom, mm. but you're doing better than the Nordics. Okay. Which makes sense because you're somewhere in between politically. You have kind of a big welfare state, but you have a little more free markets in some regards. Okay. So actually, if you measure social mobility in a correct way, you'll see that no, very big welfare states hinder social mobility. I hear you. Okay, I want to cover one more topic. And again, it's a more controversial topic because when it comes to immigration, no one wants to be in the position of blaming people who come from disadvantaged backgrounds. I mean, I know you immigrated to Sweden from a much poorer and less liberal nation, but you have a section in your book about what the results of Swedish immigration have been. Could you please talk a little bit about that and what the the consequences of that have been and how the Swedish government have had to respond to those consequences. And then maybe we can talk a bit about, you know, if you want to have immigration, what are the best policies? How can we how can we best help people pull from other nations who want to go somewhere and, and make a better life for themselves? Yeah, you know what? I don't even want to go too much into the subject because if you just mm -hmm. read any Swedish newspaper even the local papers, the top news are like killings, shootings, grenade, grenade attacks, sexual assaults, and it's linked to immigration, right. and it's linked to the inability of the welfare state to integrate foreigners, and it's linked to the fact that social mobility is very limited for foreign-born people, and it's linked to the fact that in Sweden, these people try to combine free borders 
with a very generous welfare state. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then they had a big period of denial. So, for example, one of the big groups who comes to Sweden is Afghani people. They often come from Iran, actually. And they say we're children. And many yeah. of them recently, recently they started admitting that, okay, many of them are 20, 30, even 40 years old. But because they say they're children, the government spends huge money on them. They give them asylum, although they're not, you know, they're not supposed to have it. They spend enormous amounts of money on them, and some of them go into crime, and they just say, oh, I, I'm underage, so the police lets them go. Okay, Nima, I just need to interject at this point, because, you know, we, we've heard these stories, we've heard these things coming out of Sweden, and the, the standard line I get from Swedes living in the UK and living in Scotland is, no, this is nonsense, this is just right-wing propaganda, these things don't happen. Guys with beards who look about 40 don't turn up at hostels saying, I'm a child, you know, carrying a teddy bear. This is just, you know, right-wing pornography. So you're the first person with any veracity and any weight behind you who could confirm these things. I mean, are these things true? Is it that bad? Is so, yeah, 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 it is. And, you know, uh, Sweden is a very weird country where they have consensus culture. Okay. So everybody's supposed to have the same beliefs. So let's just take the issue of people who are maybe up to 40, but often like 30, who say you're children. Yeah. Now, it has been very obvious that this is the case, right? Okay. The statistics show it. Even if you just look at the media, you see, ah, oh, here's a report about Sweden's uh, most rapidly running 14-year-old. Mm-hmm. It's like an adult man from Afghanistan. He's <laughs> towering above the children. Of course, he's running faster than them. Now, it's been very obvious, but in Sweden, uh, aggressively, they've been attacking everybody who says this. And big organizations like uh, Save the Children have been, you know, screaming that only racists say this, etc. Yeah. Now, what mm. happened was that a few weeks ago, the public broadcasting, like our BBC, they ran a story which said, obviously, these are adults. And the fact that we've been denying it has led to results like adults are going and actually living with their real immigrant children mm-hmm. and they're sexually harassing them, okay. sexually abusing them. And this policy is just wrong. And in many Swedish municipalities, they have special housing for children, immigrants who are adults okay. because you know, they know they're lying. Mm-hmm. So suddenly, over a few weeks, everybody says, yes, of course it's true. Of course, it's a a problem. Mm. I can't really explain this to you. It's a Northern European weird culture where one opinion is a correct opinion. And in the case of immigration and integration, it's just a slow moving, very weird discussion that is going on where the very obvious things, like, for example, there's a link between crime and immigration. Of course, there's a link between crime and immigration. But for 11 years, the Swedish government and the researchers have not made the data public. Right. And they're just saying, no, we don't think there's a link. No, but, you know, let's not talk about it. Oh, yeah. So it's, there's a lot of cognitive dissonance, basically, about this. Yeah, and it's shifting rapidly. And I don't like this because when I went in Swedish school, uh, there was a lot of neo-Nazis, white power movement. Yeah. I can't really describe it well, but basically the, these people in Sweden, they are either super, super politically correct and even denying reality. Or the other extreme. But then they shift. Yeah, and then they shift and they become racist. Yeah. It kind of reminds me of in 1984 that we were always at war with Eurasia. You know, the whole opinion swings at one time. In the Eurasian policies did that. That I write in my book. Everybody was like, we have open borders. And the prime minister was, there is no limit on immigrants. And then you have these poor people in the Middle East. They're selling everything they have to come to Sweden. And often they sell everything they have. They get debt to send one of their children to Sweden. Now, maybe that child is actually 25. Mm. But it comes and says, I get asylum. And then the whole family can come to Sweden. Right. Okay. And then two months later, they change their policies 180 degrees. Okay. And then, you know, they're... These poor immigrants, because Sweden fooled them into saying, come, we have free immigration. But as you say, like 1984, they suddenly change and they're like, oh, we've always been for uh, regulating borders. But wait a minute, two months ago, 
the leading politicians were saying, if you want to regulate the number of immigrants, there's something uh, mentally wrong with you. Right, right. And there's one Swedish member of parliament who, in 2012, he said this issue of child immigrants. He said, come on, Norway and Finland and Denmark, they're looking at the age medically mm. of immigrants, and then suddenly immigration fell mm. uh, to these countries, because, of course, the child immigrants, many of them make it up. Mm. You know what they said about him four years ago? Swedish National Public Radio, they said, you know what check we should do? We should make a check of the mental state of this lunatic parliament member. <laughs> right? I mean, okay. that vicious attack against a guy who was just saying rational arguments. Yeah. And today everybody says, yes, yes, of course it's a rational mm. argument. Right. So it's a, it's a mad debate. Yeah. The debate about immigration in Sweden, integration, is very mad. And from the left, they're completely denying the fact that a big welfare yeah. state, the high taxes, generous welfare, labor market regulations are stopping integration. Whereas research clearly shows that these aspects of welfare state, you know, are very bad for mm. integration, yeah. obviously. Well, how would you respond to someone who said to you, like, okay, look, Nima, this is rich coming from you, you know, because you, you yourself are, are, are an immigrant. And now, isn't it just the case that, you know, all you want to do is pull the ladder up behind you and prevent more from, from following, you know? How, how, how would you respond to that kind of accusation? You know what? I mean, you know, by debunking utopia, exposing the myth of Nordic socialism, yeah. read it. Yeah. Everything I write, I, I refer to research and knowledge and statistics. Yeah. I very, very seldomly write anything that is my opinion. Right. I don't think my opinion matters. Right, right. I think facts and logic and research matters. Yeah. And, you know, everything I've said, everything I show about the welfare state, about the limits of policy, about the importance of free markets and the culture of work, about the fact that Nordic welfare states are not transferring social success to immigrants, and lastly, about the fact that free immigration and a big welfare state is a bad recipe, everything is backed by facts. So, you know, I just mm. say just factual. That's a very emotional, almost yeah. childish argument. Yeah, the, fa the facts don't care about our feelings. And I just want to thank you for being so rigorous and bringing up the data, because if we really believe in a better world, we can't put evidence after our personal preferences or our ideology. And yeah, we'd all love to be able to think that you can just take anyone from anywhere and, and drop them anywhere and they can thrive. But if we want to have a sensible immigration policy, then we really need to look at what the data says and take our cues from that. Otherwise, we'll end up doing more harm than good. So on that point, Based on your research, do you have any tips? Again, if someone was to say, you know, Dr. Sanandaji, we've read your book and we want to make you a policy maker. What sort of policies should we be taking on immigration? Oh, I could talk for two hours about <laughs> this, but I have to go. So let me just be very short. First of all, the immigration policies are crazy in Europe because what you're doing in, in all of Europe is the people who need the most help are not getting help. There yeah. are tens mm -hmm. of millions of refugees. Nobody's paying for them, right? Mm -hmm. right? I mean, almost all refugees are in their neighbor countries, like, you know, Turkey, or they go to Iran, or they go to Brazil. Nobody's helping them. It's, it's so cheap to help them, but, you know, the Western countries say we don't, we can't afford this. Okay. Mm -hmm. But then you say, no, we'll get asylum to those who come here. Right. Mm -hmm. And look at Sweden. Who, I mean, th those who come here are the people who can afford to spend a few thousand pounds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true, yeah. And it's, it's Sweden, so for example, men, it's men. Yeah. Mm -hmm. all, you know, most of our immigrants are men. Why? Because yeah. the men can afford it. But it's the children yeah. and women who need the help. Of yes, course, right. but they, they don't have the physical power and the money to come here. And so we're giving help to the wrong people. We're giving help in a bad way. Sweden is massively seeing deterioration in immigrant neighborhood. And you have to have integration policies. You have, and you know what? You can't just say the free market solves it. In reality, the big obstacle currently is knowledge, adult knowledge, or even, you know, youth knowledge is so much lower in uh, immigrants from low education countries like Afghanistan and Syria. So they can't, these people, they can't get jobs, many of them. And so what Sweden or the UK should do is if you take 
groups of immigrants from low knowledge countries, you should invest public money. You should invest a lot of public money, give them education, give them adult education, make sure that you don't have these things like sexual assaults against women. Or in, you know what? I mean, they have a lot of sexual assaults on immigrant children from other immigrants and the police is doing nothing in Sweden. Don't have that. Don't traumatize people. Don't traumatize them by mixing jihadists who go and threaten the other immigrants. You know, you should invest money so that once the immigrants come to Sweden, they get education. They don't have to be afraid. So Christian immigrants to Sweden are very afraid because actually the same jihadists who threaten mm. them are here threatening them in the refugee camps. Absolutely, yeah. And, um. you know, just avoid this craziness. Have an orderly system. And also kind of have free market policies because that is what enables people to enter the labor market. But I think you should couple this with spending government money. You can't have, I'm saying you can't have large numbers of people from poorly educated countries coming to the West and not spend public money in increasing their social capital. If you don't do this, you'll have a a group of socially poor People who are who think they've come to a paradise in the West, but then they find they're at the very, very, very bottom of society, which is not fun. And then you'll have a lot of social problems in Europe. And then people will say, you know, uh, it's immigrants to blame. It's not the immigrants to blame. It's the policies to blame. Yeah. Okay, look, Dr. Sanandaji, we've capitalized your time. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been so enlightening and one of the best podcasts I think we've done so far. Would you grace us by coming on our program again at some time? Because there's so much we would like to talk to you about. Yes, of course. Let's do that. Okay, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. Before you part with us, could you tell our audience where they can find you, tell them about your media, anything that you've got coming up, so that more people can really benefit from the fantastic work that you've been doing. And, uh, yeah, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks. So, you know, uh, I do a lot of things, but I really recommend my new book, Debunking Utopia, Exposing the Myth of Nordic Socialism. And it's a uh, number one Amazon seller in this category, and I'd like to kind of keep it like that. So <laughs> yeah, me too. Buy it from Amazon. <laughs> okay. Right. Right. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. My my pleasure.